Well, ladies and gentlemen, it is now 20 to 8. I um, want to finish certainly by half past uh, 8. So it's over to you uh, to ask uh, questions, make comments. Um, hopefully, because this is a relatively easy, you know, in terms of uh, acoustics, you won't need a microphone. But if uh, anyone has um, a, a very quiet voice, we might thrust a microphone in your hands. So who has the first question? Yes, over here. And then uh, the lady there, yes. Thanks, I've read your book twice, but it's lovely to hear you give a presentation in person. I wonder if you can have a plan my Christmas shopping and birthday present shopping. Is there any plans for a new edition? A new edition? Yes. Well, we're working on a new book. It's not a new edition of the spirit level, but I, 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 you know, we will sort of catch people up with how research has developed since then. Um, and, and there's really been an outpouring of research. And it, it was one of, one of our goals, really, was to, was, was hoping that other academics, other researchers would, would sort of get involved in the field and would do more research. And there really has been quite, quite an outpouring of, of studies coming out um, that some of them look at the same relationships we've looked at in different parts of the world. Um, some of them, like the self-enhancement graph, sort of take things one stage further. But also, I think there's increasing interest in inequality in, different, in really different disciplines. So the economists are very interested at the moment in the relationship between inequality and debt and the boom-bust cycle. Um, I think there's quite a lot of green interest and people looking at things like um, biomass div diversity in relation to inequality. So there's lots and lots to do. And although in this new book I think we will try and catch people up with that, we also put out research digests from the Equality Trust periodically when something new um, excites us or there's a substantial body of evidence on something new. But more, our new book will be looking at the personal, the individual impact of living in more unequal societies. And, and we'll have more, a deeper exploration of, of what that does to us. Lady over here, yes. Um, as I understand it, currently in the UK, um, women have a higher life expectancy than men. Um, but I'm also under the impression that uh, women earn less than men. So if, if income, as income decreases, life expectancy decreases, is there a way of explaining a way that what perceived yeah, I mean, w women always live longer than men in every country, um, practically. And it's from conception onwards. But well, more female babies are conceived, fewer of them die during pregnancy, fewer of them die during infancy, and all the way through life, women, women do better. We're the tough um, gender. There is a social gradient in women's life expectancy, just as there is for men. Um, it's just the level tends to be different. So poorer women live much less longer than richer women. Um, there'll be some crossover at some point, but there's clearly you know, a physiological, sex-related um, difference in life expectancy, and then that gets shaped for us by the social structures we're living in, by our class and education. Lady over here. Um, I was wondering if anybody's done any research into the outliers, because I think looking at the outliers on your box might be very interesting and profitable to find out what they're in the bucking trends. Yeah. All right, I hope, you, I hope this doesn't sound rude, but I don't really care about the outliers, because in some ways, they're, they're, what, what's interesting to us is the consistency of the picture and, and the correlations that we're seeing. The fact that we see them over and over and over again for um, lots of different health and social problems. The fact that we see them in different settings. Um, th that's the really interesting piece. The idea that inequality is a, a root cause of a whole range of things. What the outliers tell you are that there are other things affecting those health and social problems as well. So we could, um, we could, we could sort of dive back, couldn't we, and have a look at... Um, 
I was thinking of mental illness in particular, but any will do. You know, Italy, Italy's way off the line there. So Italy has a very low level of mental illness, um, much lower than we'd expect, given its inequality. So other things are going on in Italy that um, protect the population. So when we see sort of countries dropping below the line, you know, you can think, well, what, what else is going on there? Maybe in Italy it's the primacy of family and family support. Maybe it's the Catholic Church. Strange audience to ask that in. But, you know, we, we can propose lots and lots of different solutions, and there'll be an individual story there. Maybe it's the food. Maybe it's the food. <laughs> there'll be a story there that explains why Italy is there. Sometimes the story will be that they didn't measure mental illness very well in Italy. We have only picked sources of data that actually we think are good. So I hope that's not the explanation. But those individual stories um, lead you down interesting pathways, but it's the main consistency of the story that I'm interested in. Does that make sense? Because actually, you know, scientists like me, epidemiologists, like we could always make up a story about why something's there and not there. Right. Shall I just try and remember who's next? It's this gentleman up here, then it's this gentleman, then it's that gentleman, then it's this lady, then it's that gentleman, then it's this lady. So that's the order, okay? Um, Mark Hudson, Manchester Planet Monthly. I want to pick on, up on something you said at the very end about this not being given to us, and that there needs to be a movement. Because what this very much reminds me of is the lead up to the war in Iraq, when all the people of <coughs> The Guardian readers and the independent readers, the unions, they all knew that something was wrong and something needed to be changed, but it didn't change. And so what I don't understand in your presentation is who you think is going to deliver this. Because the trade unions are on their knees. The church is bitter. The non-violent direct action through ditto. Your middle class professionals and I have one. We're terrified of losing our jobs. We are not going to make trouble. So who is going to do this? Mm. Because nothing has happened tonight. Sorry, just to be a little bit bullshit. <laughs> we've all come into this room. We've sat with someone we know. We've not introduced ourselves to anyone else. When we leave here, we have every bit as atomized, we used to use some dirt kind of anime, we're every bit as atomized as when we came in. And the organizers of this event could have had us just turn to the person behind you, introduce yourself for a couple of minutes, swap emails, etc. But that hasn't happened. Um, and, and that didn't happen during the Gulf War. And the movements that we need don't form. You can always join the BHA and then you'll be part of a family of people. <laughs> So thank you for that, because it is important, I think, to be bolshy and challenging. Who do I hope will give us a change? I mean, I, I suppose when we started out, we thought all we had to do was make the evidence known. <laughs> and then change would happen. And in particular, we avoided making policy prescriptions because we didn't feel qualified. Um, and we thought that's somebody else's job, it's somebody else's expertise. And then constantly found ourselves on panels and platforms with politicians saying, what do we do about it? And I think that's not my job description, that's your job description. But I think there is a, there is a sense of people at the top knowing not, not knowing what to do about it, as well as people sort of collectively at a grassroots level feeling um, disempowered and helpless. So I think it's very, very hard to know what to do. And... What, what we're trying to do personally is, is sort of get at it on different levels. So we do try to talk to politicians and policy makers and make them aware of the evidence. Um, we've just accepted an invitation from a group being convened by the government of Bhutan who don't use GDP. They use a measure of gross national happiness. 
as their measure of, of success. And they're working with the United Nations and have had a motion accepted by the UN to actually try and create um, a movement, a transition towards a new paradigm for the worldwide economy. Massively ambitious, but they're sort of pulling in all the expertise they can with the aim of delivering a report to the UN and trying to get some movement. So that's at a very sort of top level. But while that's happening, there are also our equality groups throughout the country um, coming and talking to people like this, hoping that the more people know, the more they'll realize this is unacceptable. They'll start to change perhaps a little bit in the way they think about other people in society, the deserving or the undeserving poor, or even just how they interact with one another in, in personal life and at work and things. So I think, it, I think we need change at all of those levels, from the very, very microscopic, um, do I introduce myself to somebody? I'm sitting next to them at a lecture, all the way up to, to the United Nations trying to get countries to sign up to big initiatives. But I don't, I don't feel I've got any particular knowledge about how to do those best. So I might well be um, beating my head against a brick wall a lot of the time. I don't know, I suppose I just keep on plugging, really. But I mean, I think your suggest, your, your, that suggestion of why aren't we even doing anything right here in this hall right now? Why? Let's change that. Go on. You all have a minute. Introduce yourself. Introduce yourself. Like Someone Lee next Lee. to you. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, we've, we've already done it. <laughs> so, I'm just worried that we'll sit back in the chair. Give them the kitchen. Give them the or whatever it is. Yeah. We take a couple of questions at a time. conversation that you've just started, swap email addresses, join the BHA, join the Equality <laughs> Trust, get involved in one way or another, in whichever way you think right. Um, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to start taking two questions at a time in the hope that you know, we'll, we'll sort of get as many as we can. And gentlemen here, and then gentlemen in the front row, these two, if you can give your question briefly first. Oh, uh, I'm not the economist. <laughs> well, I just thought I'd point it out to people because um, perhaps we don't need to be um, too pessimistic because this week's Economist is all about capitalism and inequality. And they're worried about it. It's not, this is not a huge issue. They are worried about it, even just for the sake of aggregate demand. So perhaps we don't need to be so pessimistic. Yeah. Well, they're, they're going to cut their bonuses from a million to you know, 500,000. This is an elite publication. They are worried about it. That must have been talked about it. You know, weak aggregate demand leads to more crisis. OK, thanks. And, and, uh, <coughs> yes, I was very interested. Uh, Martin Adams. Down the room. Martin Adams is my name. Um, I was very interested in your comment that um, uh, social movements come from below. That sounded a very cheerful statement. Um, but then I thought, well, is it really going to happen? Uh, and I, I wondered, uh, uh, there's a different thing that I think I'm worried about, and, and that's the resistance to change coming from above, um, where the wealthy have the, the means 
to, to, to carry out that, uh, that resistance to the power that the money gives them. I just wondered if you could point to any ways uh, in which their power, this, this sort of power that they have to maintain or even improve their uh, dominant position uh, could be curbed. Um, uh, after the answer to that, well, it's the gentleman over there and the lady here are the next two. Yeah. The reason I said, oh, no, not The Economist is, have you read it? Not yet. Okay. <laughs> so The Economist this week has, has an issue that, that's, that's got a big special report on inequality. So lots of people emailed us and said, look, The Economist is doing a great, wonderful report on um, inequality. So I thought, oh, I'll buy it this week. And they mention our work, actually, and they say it's been thoroughly debunked. <laughs> so that's why I said, oh, no, not The Economist. <laughs> hmm? Yeah, well, it's always different people. And with The Economist, you don't get a byline, so you don't know who's actually writing it. So when you write to the editor in strongly worded terms, you have to say, you. You know, you have, have misrepresented the evidence. So on Saturday night, um, we were coming back on a train from London, and I'd picked it up at the station, so we spent the train journey composing a strongly worded <laughs> response to the editor. Because actually I felt, um, and we did feel quite strongly, that they were misrepresenting the evidence to their, to their readership. Some of you may be aware that there were a couple of publications that were strong criticisms of our work um, from the right. But since then there has been an independent review of the evidence by the Joseph Roundtree Foundation comes down very much in favour of inequality being damaging. Um, and of course, there's a wealth, a wealth of new research, loads of it. So actually, I felt that whoever the journalist was was being pretty sloppy. So, we, so we've written something cross <laughs> to the editor. Bolshy. That's the right word. It's bolshy. But at the same time, I am really pleased that The Economist is devoting a huge special report to the impact of inequality. They seem to be more interested in its economic impact than they are in the health and well-being of the population of the world. But it's a start. Um, what should we do with all the rich people? It's tempting to get all Shakespearean, isn't it, and sort of say, shoot, shoot all the lawyers. But um, Next time, Steve. I suppose what I think is the most um, hopeful path I can tread is to keep on doing research that shows it matters for them. That inequality not only drastically affects the life chances and well-being of the poor, but it matters to them and it matters to their children. I mean, in a way, we can see it matters already. Why live in a gated community if you're not actually frightened of what society is like out there? Why send your children to schools that cost £40,000 a year if you don't actually think they need to be protected and privileged in, in particular ways? So actually, there's a cost to living in a more unequal society that is already experienced by those with more, more wealth and power. I think they're not aware of it, um, and I think we need to sort of try and, and make those links more explicit. Um, but if you have enough of a social movement, I then the, the trappings of power fall away a bit. So I suppose we need to storm the barricades a bit more and get a bit more bullshit Thank as you. well. Gentleman over, over there who had his hand up before. Yeah. Was it you? Yes. And then this lady here. Yes. Um, about the social evaluative threat, uh, my question was really just who are people comparing themselves to? Is it keeping up with the Joneses, like your neighbours, or what happened to the friends I went to school with, or kind of how does that work? Uh, also, a bit cheeky, one other question. Um, after the uh, speaking to the neighbours thing, I thought that was so good. Do you think you'd consider doing that at all of your future events as well? Uh, great questions. Oh, I 
think I'll definitely do this at all events if I remember um, getting on a bit. I don't always remember to do the things I'm supposed to do, like mention the Equality Trust or, you know, um, have a whip round for donations or anything important. I will try and do it. I think it's really great. I mean, a lot of the, a lot of the groups that ask us to come and talk have that kind of fellowship connection or whatever going on. Um, whether they're religious groups, community groups, charities. So, so perhaps it isn't always necessary to, to prod it. But I will try and remember. Um, what was your other question? I'm really sorry. See? See how bad I am at remembering? Hmm? Who, do people Who do people compare themselves to? Yeah, that's a really good question. So I think the, the view of sociologists used to be that you compare yourself to your near neighbours. <coughs> So you're keeping up with the Joneses. It is sort of those around you. But actually, if you look at inequality within small neighbors, neighborhoods or areas, that doesn't really matter. You don't have worse health in a deprived inner city area of Manchester because of any inequality within it. You have it because it's deprived in relation to the rest of society. And I actually think that, that since sociologists were thinking about this in the 60s, our society and our culture has really changed as well. And so that actually we're all aware of the whole cl social class spectrum because we're all, um, we all read newspapers or magazines or watch television, um, you know, and, and lots and lots of popular programs are about the super rich. So I think, I think there's a greater awareness of the national pyramid than there used to be. Um, and I think we make comparisons at that level as well as in relation to those we know and those we associate it with. So I think both matter. Um, and the, the other question from, from, from the lady at the front here was, can you have too much equality, too much of a good thing? And the answer to that is we don't know. If you look at all of these graphs, it looks like a pretty linear relationship. As things get more equal, they get progressively better. But we stop at the point at which we have um, Japan and those Scandinavian countries. We haven't got any more countries more equal than there um, in, among the rich, affluent countries. So we don't know. And the only experience we've had in the past of, of societies trying to achieve a greater level of equality have been marred by things that we're not seeing in the countries we're looking at. So huge amounts of, of control. Um, and so we don't know. Could you have a more equal society than Japan and the Scandinavian countries and things would be even better there? I don't know. And I think it's important that we don't leap to conclusions outside of, of, of the boundaries of the evidence. No country's tried that or achieved that. So we don't know what would happen. I don't know if there's some point at which we start to see problems related to a greater homogenisation or equality. But it would make great reality TV, wouldn't it, actually? <laughs> <laughs> Test it out a bit. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, correlation is, of course, not causation. Uh, is it not likely that there are certain cultural factors, history, beliefs, uh, values, that affect both the spreading the income and also all the problems the other problems we've been highlighting. Mm -hmm. And could we identify those? Yeah. Do we need a new Messiah or <laughs> to change our atmosphere? Do we have a second? Yes, that's what we're doing. Seems to me in my lifetime we in my adult lifetime we've been living more and more in this bizarre economic paradigm that we've experienced over the last and 20 years in which the general norm of views has just become more and more, and it is very, very right wing. The rich have to be given more in order to persuade them to be part of society, poor people have to have things taken away, and that's not how it was when I was, was growing up. But I do, I just think it's fantastic that the sports been published, and so many people are here listening to this and would just say that I think we should be quite hopeful of change, that we all have to want to be part of it ourselves. And we all have to go out and convey this message in other organisations that are part of and campaign and talk about it and um, try to influence policy makers at all levels. 
that's how much energy um, uh, when I was on the train coming over here, I've, I've got a set of slides that sort of, is this a causal relationship set of slides? And I thought, shall I put them in or shall I put the environment slides in? So I'm afraid um, the environment won and, and I left those out. But it's an, it's an important question. You know, the kind of work we do is observational science. We can't prove causality. We can't have an experiment where we make some countries more equal and some less equal and then see, see what happens. So we're always um, doing observational science. But epidemiologists have developed a set of criteria for assessing causality um, from a body of observational evidence when you can't do experiments. Um, and the criteria include things like looking for the strength of a relationship. Some of these are incredibly strong, some are weaker looking for consistency, so the fact that we see this in the US states as well as in the rich countries, and now there's evidence from Latin America, regions of China. Um, so we have, you know, looking for dose response sort of things. Um, so we have a set of criteria. The most important challenge is always, is there another explanation? Is there an alternative explanation for this pattern? So, so here's the pattern. Um, and the, the short answer is, no, I don't know of any other factor that explains that relationship um, better than inequality. And the challenge comes from thinking about your alternative explanation, whether it's culture or, or something else. Um, the most popular in America is ethnic heterogeneity. What they mean is they have more problems because they have more ethnic minorities. Um, but what you have to do if you have an alternative explanation is explain why Portugal does so badly and Spain does so well. When they are culturally so similar, historically have been quite similar, but they have very different levels of inequality and that's their level of health and social well-being. You have to explain why Sweden and Japan <coughs> do so well when they're so different in so many other ways. Position of women in society, how close they keep to the nuclear family, whether they get their inequality through redistribution or smaller income gaps to start with. And, it, and, and there are similar sort of games to play in the US states. So there are lots of potential alternative explanations, and they may, in a sense, play a role in some of those individual countries' histories of things. But I'm sure you've all heard of Occam's razor. The simplest explanation in science is often the one that's true. Nothing, nothing, you can't put anything else along the bottom there that fits as well for this index of health and social problems or explains those quirkiness. Um, and the, the last question, well, it wasn't really a question, was it? Which is great. It was a sort of call to arms. Um, <laughs> But it, it did remind me of something that I, I wish I'd remembered um, when I was asked a question by, by someone at the top about where, where might we see change happen. Um, and Richard and I have been working a lot um, at local authority level recently because various um, local authorities around the country have established fairness commissions. It started with Islington um, and it's, it's spread. It's a bit of a rash at the moment. Richard chaired the Islington Fairness Commission, and we've both been commissioners on the York one. But there are fairness commissions, commissions in Sheffield, in Liverpool, um, Blackpool, Newcastle, and I think that there are more, and I'm there's running out. There's something going on in Trafford just recently. Right. So, so there's a real movement. And although they're all different, they've been, cons they've been constituted differently. They have slightly different remits. They work in different ways. They all share a commitment to trying to actually decrease income inequalities in, in local authority areas and increase fairness and they have all worked in ways that are pretty transparent and that involve community groups in different ways and I think that's really good and they have all so far, they have all, those that have reported, committed to paying a living wage. Now they are huge employees of public sector employees in their areas but they can also set a tone and they can also require through their procurement and contracting with private um, companies that they pay a living wage as well. So all, I used to think you can't really mess around with, with wage and income structures and stuff unless you do something nationally, but, but you can. 
and we're seeing real leadership and sort of action for change at a local level. So I think that's quite exciting and it is a way that people can get involved by either pressing for a fairness commission in their areas or um, contributing to one that's actually happening. Uh, my name is Phil Thomas and I work as a psychiatrist in the NHS for over 20 years. And my question really concerns the role of science and the different forms of science that you use in developing your arguments. And it seems to me that once the, the, there's a huge body of evidence that you draw on from epidemiology, which is, say, is about populations, then you go on to what, what I and other people would see is actually a very individualistic approach to trying to explain this in terms of stress and the way it affects individuals. And what concerns me about this is that, um, and this draws in on some of the other points that people have made about, um, you know, it's about the role that science and different forms of science play in our society. But uh, once the politicians and the people in the Department of Trade and Industry get to hear that, oh well, this is to do with stress and it's to do with the way social factors affect the individual, that they'll be talking to their friends in the pharmaceutical industry and then we'll have a whole new development, a whole new sort of industry spawning uh, that will uh, ameliorate, ameliorate the effects of this rather than actually dealing with the political uh, message that's right at the heart of your argument. Thank you. And, uh, gentleman up there at the back, yeah. Um, I have a question about, you mentioned that, you mentioned that uh, lots of people have come out and supported your work and various other bits of research, but, and you also mentioned briefly that two journals have published uh, responses, critical responses to your work. I was wondering if you could uh, tell us a bit more about that critical response and whether you've seen it as a threat, and even if it isn't um, academically sound, whether it's uh, kind of carried far in, in the mainstream media. Mm -hmm. How do you think your project has come across um, to the public at large, not just the people here who yeah. maybe uh, people kind of switch on and yeah. coming to these things? Thank you. Um, it's interesting, the role of science. In, in a way, we've got um, sort of a case study here, haven't we, really, with the economist Richard Layard and his work on happiness. Um, I mean, Rich, Richard Layard is an economist who's very interested in, in happiness as a measure of sort of how well societies are doing and wrote um, a book in some ways, quite similar to the book we wrote. In fact, we stole some ideas, like put a cartoon at the beginning of every chapter and make your graph simple, that sort of thing. And he not only managed to sort of move happiness up the political agenda, he also managed to convince the government to invest a huge amount in cognitive behavioral therapy to alleve, alleviate distress. Now, I think that's completely the wrong solution just as um, a pharmaceutical solution would be. And in, in both cases and here, although we see the impact of inequality at an individual level, you know, it is it's getting under our skin, it's affecting how we feel and think. The problem is structural, and the solutions must be structural. So when I say that you know, we need to talk to one another, we need to communicate, we need to be more respectful in our relationships with each other. I do think that's very, very important, and I would guess that nobody in the room disagrees with me. But it is the structural stuff we need to change. Um, I don't know, I'd like to see the pharmaceutical industry have a go at it, actually. <laughs> I don't need to. <laughs> But, um, you know, th that, that's what we need. I mean, we need cognitive behavioural therapy for those who are suffering, and we need pharmaceutical <coughs> interventions for those who, who will benefit from them. But we need structural change. And um, the public at large, and, and how... I mean, you, of course, you're a lovely audience. I mean, I would say that, wouldn't I, because you're still doing that judging. Thing. But, um, and most audiences we talk to, they, they, they've invited us to speak because they want to hear. Most of the people who come to listen are probably already sort of on page, thinking in similar ways. Um, 
That doesn't mean it's unimportant to do it, because I think for a lot of us, our intuitions about how society works um, and things is not the same as having evidence that it's so. But of course, it's a big world out there, and even if you sell 150,000 books, that is a tiny, tiny drop in the ocean. And despite having a lot of media coverage, you can guess where most of our media coverage has been. Radio 4 and The Guardian. Um, the, the critical attacks on our work were not in peer-reviewed journals. They were in publications um, supported by two different think tanks, one in America, one in, one in Britain, which, of course, they're perfectly entitled to do. Um, and our response to them has been very much um, through working, uh, participating in the JRF Independent Review, responding to those critics in the, in the, in the arenas um, that are more public rather than in the obscure peer-reviewed journals that, that nobody reads. But after a while, we sort of stopped doing it because we sort of felt we'd made our, our points and felt they, they were robust enough. Um, I, I mean, I would guess if you went out and asked the man on the street, most, most people would have never heard of what we're talking about tonight. And it, in fact, someone rang us up quite recently and said, are you watching University Challenge? Because they just asked a question about your book. <laughs> and um, woohoo, you know, you're famous. And that's the good news. And then he said, here's the bad news. None of them knew the answer. <laughs> <laughs> neither team, neither team knew the answer. So, so even when you write something which you think is quite wide-reaching, you, you are only reaching a tiny, tiny segment of society. I suppose you just have to keep working at it, have to keep looking for other venues to do this. Um, there is a company that's making a film. A film has a lot more um, power to reach people than, than doing talks or, or writing a commentary for The Guardian. Richard did a TED talk. Um, for those of you familiar with TED talks, you know, you'll know how popular those are. That's had, um, I think, a million and a half hits. So that's a, you know, that's, that's a wider reach. Um, I think and we just have to keep... And this talk will eventually be on yeah, the BHA website. Yeah, we just have to keep doing this. We're working on producing educational packs for schools. We hope to get issues around inequality um, introduced into the curriculum for 14 to 17 year olds in different subjects in different ways. So I think you just have to go on all, all, all fronts, but I, I think you're probably right and that most people in this country will have never heard of us or our book or know about um, how bad inequality is in society or, or even have a sense of where they might, how they might start to think about it. So I think we just have to keep working until that's not true. Well, we've, we've um, got uh, less than 10 minutes, so um, uh, we won't, probably can't take any more uh, questions from those who have already indicated. Naya and then this lady. Yes, yes, you're in the next batch, this, that gentleman and this and you. But I'm sorry if I've taken you out of turn. I'm not taking you out of turn, I think I'm kind of on this. And I entirely agree with you. I'm sure all of us here agree with that we really need to have as less unequal a society as possible. I don't think, personally, that it would be for biological and genetic reasons that that would ever be possible. So, of course, we need to aim for that. That's the point that I want to make. My question is, you showed a slide on the scales about uh, Japan and uh, Sweden uh, on different sides of the scale, both working towards the same end. Where do you stand on that? I'm not quite sure I do understand the question. Do you mean where, where would I prefer to live? No, no. <laughs> uh, which, what uh, procedure would you like to adopt? Oh, ah, I see. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. Sorry. I'm sorry, maybe a bit slow. Yeah. Well, I sort of tied in, actually, um, yet another NHS. Mm -hmm. um, it's a psychiatrist picking up the pieces, really, and where you can see that, that you're dealing with it before that. But my question was slightly different. It was. What do you think went wrong? And there was that long period of equality, and then suddenly you have the Gordon Gecko, who was meant to be a monster, but everyone was mine. What, what, if you think that history is useful in planning for the future, why do you think it went wrong? Mm. The next people is the gentleman over there and the lady up there as well. Have the lady first and then the second. 
Uh, and then I think we probably might be getting to the end. Yeah. Right. Where do I stand? Um. <coughs> My, my view is I would like all of these things to happen, but I, I'll be more specific than that. The problem, I think, with doing things to do with redistribution and taxes and benefits is that they necessarily involve government action, whether it's national or local government. And the problem with that is that we might all see something that we think is progressive change and are pleased with, but then the next lot can come in and change it. So it's not, it's not stable. And I think what we're looking at over here about um, employee democracy, really, increasing um, democracy within our workplaces is a much more sustainable change. We, I mean, it's at work that income differences are created. And it's at work that we experience hierarchy most. And I think if in, in companies that shift from being, to, to being employee-owned or becoming mutuals or cooperatives, they describe it as sort of ceasing um, to be just sort of a workplace but becoming a community. Those changes are sort of harder to shift. So if I had to choose, that's what I'd choose. It might be slower, but I, I think it will create more entrenched levels of equality um, that are more likely to be long-term. Where did it all come from? Why did it all go wrong? I don't know. I mean, I'm not not a political historian or an economic historian, so I'm not sure. On the reading we've done, um, we, um, Paul Krugman, who's a Nobel Prize winning economist in the United States, his analysis of the changes there are that we saw a lot of um, move towards equality as we tried to sort of compensate people for the First World War and the Great Depression and that the rest of it was also to do with the fear of communism, that America felt very threatened by, by the Soviet Union and, um, and what was going on over there, and so sort of through that post-Second World War period was trying to, to make things a bit more equal because otherwise they might have a revolution. I don't know how good an analysis that is, but after, you know, what, what we see in sort of late 1970s is a rising dominance of neoliberal economics um, and the rise of the power of the economics profession over, over politics. Um, and that certainly spread from sort of Reaganomics over here um, to seeing Thatcherite economics. But I don't know. I don't know the whole story. I think it's probably important to know that. And I mean, I think one of, one of the joys of doing this kind of research is... Um, having the opportunity to try and spend some time with people who do know those things, you know, people within other research areas and disciplines who can contribute. And so I'm working quite hard at the moment to think about creating a centre for the study of inequality that would bring together different social sciences and other disciplines, actually, that, that can contribute and help us understand. Thank you. Lady up there. Sorry you've had to wait so long. That's OK, no problem. Lots of people had to wait for time. <laughs> Um, I was just interested to hear how your local groups are going and if they're, you know, surviving or thriving and how many you have. Um, and the other thing that I was thinking is that, you know, I've noticed that your book, you divide it up into sustainability, health, crime, etc., education. Um, and I work in sustainability and climate change. And for me, you know, I'm involved in so many things, really interested in spirit level stuff, I try to integrate it in everything that I do. But I just don't have time to get involved in a local group, you know, because I've got so many other things going on, and I'm sure that many people are like that. And I wonder, you know, what efforts are being made to work more thematically, so that because ultimately equality needs to be integrated into all of those areas. So, what efforts are being made to, for example, form collaborations and partnerships, and to to build capacity um, through, for example, the climate change movement? Or, yeah. You know, you're talking about education yeah. as well, but, but all the different sectors that you talked about in your book. Thank 
It's fantastic. It's a brilliant argument, brilliantly written book. Well, since I've read it, it's fantastic for a socialist to read it um, because, you know, what you're saying up there is a is a, a is a political prescription in a macro sort of way, and it's what's necessary. But if I could be so churlish just to sort of add a slight sort of criticism that, that I, I felt about it when I read it, which was that it was almost kind of a it, it, it ended up with almost a lack of a, a political prescription at a local micro level, almost just sort of leaving us without uh, some ideas or suggestions, although we might have some, about what we could do. I mean, we don't have those economic macro levers of power ourselves. So I suppose I'm resonating a bit with the gentleman up, up there in terms of his kind of like, what's the broad political response here? You know, and, and you know, it, it seemed to kind of feel to me that you ended up just saying, well, we've got to, which you kind of just said now, we need more co-ops and kind of John Lewis type partnership models. But I work in the NHS where a couple of my colleagues have spoken already and you know the disparity of income between the chief exec of the NHS and uh, poor you know lowly paid cleaners at the bottom it's massive it's beyond seven times eight times and even in local NHS trusts in Manchester it's the same so it leaves me kind of wondering you know what what's the political prescription here I'm going to take those two together because in a way they're they're sort of connected and and you know I sort of start with an apology because I I think, as I said before, we didn't realise anybody would want us to do that. I mean, in a way, epidemiologists have, always, have often sort of described problems, found causal pathways and proposed solutions without really understanding what's going on. So if you're Jon Snow and you discover that turning off the Broad Street pump cures cholera, you don't really need to understand germ theory. So we've always done a lot of sort of stuff without really knowing what, what we're doing. Um, and not worrying too much if it, if it works. But I, th I think we did genuinely think, you know, that this is an area where a lot of other people do have expertise. They know how to campaign. They know how to pull the policy levers. Um, they understand what can be done, and that's not ours. So we will not get into that arena. And I think it did disappoint some people, because people do like to be told what to do. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, we've, we've tried to sort of address that more with action since the book was published. You know, so we established the Equality Trust with others because there wasn't anybody campaigning on these issues. Um, and the decision to support local groups was, was also um, as a mechanism to, to try and get people campaigning locally as well as contributing to sort of national <laughs> campaigns. But we're complete and utter beginners at this. You know, we really are sort of dipping our toes in the water, learning as we go. I've become a trustee on a different charity just so I can learn how, how others do it because, it because it's not something we know how to do. So, so we're starting off. We have a, I can't remember the exact number of local groups at the moment. I think the last time I looked it was 19, but I think I might be out of date. We have international groups as well, and we do have someone at the trust who's, who spends their time travelling and supporting local groups. Um, many of them will be joining us in London on Saturday for the TUC March. I'm sure many of you will be there too. If you want to come by for coffee and, and something at the Equality Trust before you go on the march, you'll be very welcome. We're open for business from, I think, 9 a.m. How do we connect with other movements? Because the agendas are so shared. Um, again, because we're beginners at this, we're sort of taking baby steps, but we have had discussions with um, Greenpeace about whether or not we can connect with them. Because in the past, most people didn't do single issue politics. They did party politics. And you found the party that represented all the issues you cared about. And now much more, we all tend to get involved in single issue groups. And that means nobody's got the time to devote to, to sort of all the causes that they champion. So I think it is up to us at the trust level and at the local group level to think about making those connections so that people don't have to divide their time um, and, and can campaign more efficiently because we're joined up. So I, I think we do need to do more of this. But, but we're constantly learning 
about what we're doing wrong and, and trying to do it better. Um, and I do, I do hope as many of you as possible will join us on that journey and instruct us as we need it so that we can actually all make a difference together. Well, thank you very much. I'm, I'm afraid we've run out of time. I, I want to thank Kate Pickett uh, particularly for a fantastic lecture and talk and, and discussions. Uh, my, my feelings are that what she's told us is not just radical and revolutionary, but it's, it's compelling. Uh, and uh, I sense a feeling of, if not frustration, but need to do something. Uh, and she's mentioned a few things. Um, uh, one of my colleagues, I, I know we haven't announced this, but one idea is perhaps to take up a bit of a collection for the Equality Trust. And uh, one of my colleagues will be holding a receptacle out for that purpose. Uh, as you go out. But don't forget also the liaise and connect with your neighbours as, as we started doing earlier. Um, and uh, other than that, I want you to show your appreciation for Kate Pickett. Thank you. Thank you.